So a few months ago, I gave myself an ancient Greek makeover, and I thought that it would actually be fun to continue the series a little bit, so this time around, I'm going to be giving myself a Viking makeover. Now, I lived in Iceland for about five years, so I've learned a lot about the culture, I've learned a lot about the Vikings in the past, I've read some of the sagas, I've even learned a lot about Icelandic folklore during my time living there, and Jægtalr Smá Íslandsku. So I thought that this would be a really fun experience, and also something to put me out of my comfort zone a little bit because I've really been enjoying sewing more ancient historical fashion lately and wearing it every day and so naturally I think going into Viking stuff just felt like a very organic sort of progression. I could go and research Viking fashion and do all that which is still going to happen a little bit for this project but I actually thought it would be a bit more fun to get someone else involved which is my friend Lilia Husmo who is half Icelandic and half Norwegian and she's a fashion historian, and she's also researched Viking fashion quite extensively. So I thought it'd be cool to ask her what she thinks I should sew, as well as get some ideas for hair and makeup. That way we can have the most authentic experience possible. And I just really love Lilia, and she's an amazing person, so I wanted her involved in this project for sure. So yeah, what do you think I should do for my clothing? What, what kind of ideas do you have in mind? Because keep in mind too, I have to be able to sew it like in a week by hand, you know? The nice thing about Viking fashion is the very classic kind of medieval uh, style things where they're trying to use the fabric in the most convenient way possible. So it's all very like straight lines, it's not a lot of like weird difficult things to that you're gonna have to stress about. When a lot of people think Viking fashion they think immediately of like those turtle brooch like apron dresses um, but I think that might be a bit difficult for you because I don't think you have any brooches that would kind of work for that. So I think instead we're it would be a good idea to do something kind of simpler and more everyday fashion rather than fancy party fashion. Obviously because the Viking Age was a long time ago, um, we don't have a lot of references for exactly what people wore. A lot of it is inspired by art and kind of what we think might it look like. But there's a couple findings of like bog bodies that are like really good examples of like the shapes. But I think in particular, uh, what we can look at is a finding in Greenland. That's a Norse settlement that they basically found entire garments. The earth being so frozen, they just didn't decompose. Something kind of like this one finding in Greenland, they made a pattern book, which is so, <laughs> so nice. It's very similar to medieval fashion in that it's just a rectangle and then you add in more triangles to get the big skirt. Do you have any wool fabric or something? I do. I have some wool. What sort of uh, colors do you think I should stick to? So I'm thinking for like a more casual one, maybe some kind of nice earthly colors. They would have been using plant eyes at this time, so obviously nothing like bright pink or anything. They did have a lot of really colorful colors to work from. So you can go with like red or green or yellow. Blue would also have been an option, but that would usually probably be used for like slightly fancier wear uh, because it's an expensive dye. All right, so now that we've spoken to Lydia about everything and we've got some ideas about what materials and what general garment I'm going to be making, I had to go into my stash and I found the fabric and I showed it to her. She said it was perfect. And it is this gorgeous kind of rusty orange brown herringbone wool. It's nice and lightweight, which I think is going to be great for this everyday dress that she recommended I make. And best of all, I actually got it gifted to me for free by someone. So that's just an added bonus. I've been waiting for the perfect project to use it because it's such a gorgeous material that I wanted it to go to a very specific garment. So yeah, now that we have our fabric, I'm gonna start getting to drafting and sewing. The sewing commenced and I laid out my fabric after drafting the various pieces to cut them all out. I utilized this option from the book Medieval Garments Reconstructed Norse Clothing Patterns by Elsa Ostergaard, which is the one that Lilia mentioned earlier. I won't be sharing the actual patterns, of course, as I think it is important to support the author, but you can see here at least the cutting diagram, which shows you just how many pieces go into making this garment. To sew the garment, I used a mix of back stitches and running back stitches, whatever I was in the mood for at the moment of sewing, basically. According to some additional info that Lilia gave me, long seams were likely sewn from the right side with small invisible stitches. But I went for a back stitch instead, as it's still a probable choice and I'm just more comfortable with it. 
Historically, these seam allowances were most likely finished with overcasting, which is what I'm going to do eventually as well, except I definitely ran out of time by the end of this. You'll see what I mean in a little bit. I'm just reading a little bit of Restaurant at the End of the Universe by Douglas Adams before I go to bed. And I managed to get a lot done for the Viking dress today regarding the sewing. I think that tomorrow I will just about manage to get the whole dress done, which is great because that means I'm set on track to be able to get the entire makeover completed before the video has to come out. So now it's time for me to get ready for bed so that I can wake up fresh tomorrow and get even more done. Tonight, like most nights, I'll be sleeping on my Brooklyn and Sheets, who are the kind sponsor of today's video. I absolutely love Brooklyn and Sheets and they're always my go-to option because of their comfort, quality, durability, and the fact that they breathe so well, creating all night temperature regulation. Since we're coming out of winter and into spring in the Northern Hemisphere and the flowers are in full bloom, to honor one of my favorite times of year, I felt inspired to refresh my bedroom decor a little bit. I love to do this for new seasons, just to celebrate, honor, and welcome them in. Because of this, I chose Brooklinen's Lux Hardcore Sheet Bundle in the color Cool Pink with extra pillowcases in the color Tropical Orchid. I chose to select two pinkish tones as I felt this better represented the diversity of pinks that you tend to find in the spring trees this time of year. Brooklinen is a luxury sheets company creating high quality home goods to elevate your home. I personally find it so important to invest in sheets that not only are going to last a long time, but are going to get softer with each wash. Brooklinen also just launched a ton of new and exciting colors and patterns on their website, so there's something for everyone. My next order may have to be Abyss. It's such a stunning deep blue. Willow and Blue Tide are also some of my personal favorites. Instead of buying individual items, you can save 20% by purchasing a hardcore bundle, which includes a core sheet set, extra pillowcases, and a duvet cover. You can mix and match over 20 plus colors and patterns. Brooklyn and Sheets are OECOTEC certified, meaning that they're tested for harmful substances and certified to meet the strict global safety criteria of the standard 100 by OECOTECs, assuring safety for you and your family. Best-selling Lux Satin Sheets are the ultimate bedding upgrade, perfect for elevating your sheet game. These sheets feature a luxurious 480 thread count and a slightly luminous finish. You can shop for your Brooklyn and Lux Hardcore Sheet Bundle from the comfort of your home. And these sheets don't just feel great, but they look great too. Trust me, I sleep on them all the time. You spend one third of your life in sheets, so get yourself some that are going to really upgrade your sleep. Brooklyn and Sheets are tried and true with over 100,000 five-star reviews, which is more than any other online bedding company. Brooklyn and is offering you all a special discount of $20 off any order over $100. Just click the link in the description box and use my code VXBirchwood at checkout. Thank you so much to Brooklyn and for sponsoring this video. And now I'm going to go and get ready for bed. That way I can wake up refreshed tomorrow and get back to sewing this Viking dress. I finally finished the body of this dress. I'm very behind schedule, but that's okay. I'm going to make it work. I've actually been sleeping in parts, which is giving me serious flashbacks to the Victorian sleep experiment. Also, ignore my hair because I've just been working all day, so, you know, it's a mess. Aside from the sleeves and all the finishing work, the dress is basically done. I haven't tried it on yet, so this is well and truly going to be the first reveal of me actually trying on this garment. And the good thing about Viking clothing, at least this specific dress, is that it's not at all form-fitting. So it's a little bit more forgiving with the sizing. Holding it up to myself earlier, it did look like it fit, and I can usually tell, so... I'm pretty confident that it's going to fit, but as soon as I try this thing on, I will then decide if I'm ready to put the sleeves together because that's the final component aside from binding the neckline. I'm not probably going to be able to hem it before I need to release this video nor finish all of the inside seams, but that's okay because I can always do that later and as long as it's wearable, that's the only thing that matters. And of course, for some reason, I had to choose the most complex of all of the dresses that I had to choose from. You know that D&D &D chaotic good, lawful evil chart? I definitely think I'm chaotic good. I've thought about it a lot, and so many of the choices I seem to make in my life are very, very chaotic good. But okay, let's try this on and see if it actually fits me. And if it doesn't, I don't know what I'm going to do, but... Uh, 
let's just hope it does. All right, here it is. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm not wearing the red undergarments. I'm wearing a Victorian chemise, which obviously wouldn't have been the thing during the Viking period. But overall, I'm pretty happy with the fit. I do feel like it's a little bit tight here in the bust area. It's kind of doing something kind of strange compression-y to this region, but I think it's okay. And I think it is good enough for this specific project. And I think as well, once the sleeves get set in, it'll be a little bit different. Overall, pretty happy with the fit. I don't think it could have been a ton better. Maybe making a medium one would have been a little bit better, but I think I'm kind of between medium and small, so I had to sort of make an executive decision. I guess too, it's good to have a little bit of bust support anyways, so maybe if I can just figure out what's going on with it, then I can get it to work for me. <laughs> I'm going to start working on the sleeves now, and then I'm going to edit like the wind, and then I'm going to do the whole makeover. Still a lot to do, but gonna make this work. <laughs> I spent quite a few more hours this night sewing and sewing the sleeves with running back stitches and back stitches, just trying to get them done so I could finally feel like the end was near for the completion of the garment. My favorite little detail about these sleeves is the triangular gusset at the wrist, which you can also see in the original. I think it adds a really sweet extra touch to the construction. I just woke up a little while ago and I finished the dress except I don't know what to do with the neckline. Because I just woke up, I obviously am not wearing any makeup and I look like I just woke up. So I've set in the sleeves, which is always the fun part. And now I'm going to try the dress on again, but this time with the proper linen undershift. So that way I can get an actual representation of what it's going to be like wearing this garment. And then I'm gonna decide what to do with the neck because I'm debating whether to cut a slit into it and add a little gusset to create a little extra space in the bust. The determinant for this is going to be whether or not it's difficult for me to get into it. So basically, if I cannot get into the garment, then I'm going to cut the slit, of course, because I need to be able to get into the garment. And if I can get into the garment, and it's really, really tight, then maybe I might consider doing the slit. I have no idea why I'm doing the whole project like this, but it's just like this sometimes with sewing. You kind of just have to embrace the chaos of it. All right, it's on. But to be honest, it's pushing so weird on my bust region that I'm genuinely worried if I show this. Uh, so I'm not going to. Uh, just trust me on this. So yeah, I need to come up with a solution. Now made the little slit, as you can see, it's looking a bit better. This is naturally how my bust wants to sit. So I'm going to use this as the guideline for the little triangle. Kind of looks cute, just like this too. Like I feel like it could. Yeah, but you can imagine all of my bust was being compressed into this area. This is not a curdle. This is not meant to be a curdle. It was pushing everything down, which I did not like, felt bad too. So I just need to create a little triangle here, super easy. Pattern drafted. I've added in the insert. Now I have a little bit more room for my bust. It's still pushing down a little bit, which is okay. I think I'm, I can live with that. But yeah, I'm overall pretty happy with it. I'm gonna just bind the neckline now and then go on to the makeover part because I'm running out of time. And I think this is the best that it's going to get. Sometimes you just have to let something go and keep moving forward. So that's where I'm at with this project. I'll see you in the next part once I have finished everything and I'm ready to start doing the rest of the look. Regarding makeup, what, what do you suggest I do? So for makeup, basically, we have very little records of Vikings actually using makeup. However, there are a few descriptions specifically of something that's described as coal eyeliner. So like what they would use in Egypt, for example. There was an Arab traveler who went and specifically recorded seeing that the Vikings wore coal around their eyes. So it was both men and women would be wearing probably eyeliner. There's no record of any like facial powder or like stuff like that. I think there's been one finding of like that, like lead powder uh, in a woman's grave, but like 
there was nothing on the body, so they don't think it's used for uh, face makeup. For makeup, you should go really easy on the makeup and do like just kind of dark eyeliner. It's probably just like a little bit of black around the eyes. It would probably have been a paste that was applied with some sort of brush or just your fingers. So I'm here to do my Viking hair and makeup. Fun, fun, fun. Lilia said that the primary emphasis with Viking makeup is on the eye area. So very dark coal liner, which I'm familiar with because of the ancient Greek look that I did. Since I am on camera, the camera tends to like dole down everything. So I am actually going to put on a face of very natural skin looking makeup. Just a little bit of under eye concealer, a little bit of CC cream, and that's just to help smooth everything out and just make it look a little bit more present on the camera because it's gonna look a lot different in real life than it does when it comes through a lens. I already cleaned and moisturized my face, so now it's ready for me to start adding things to it. Yay! Then I'm just setting everything with a powder, a really light translucent powder. So that way it doesn't even really look like I'm wearing any makeup as my base. Get out of there. Come on, you can do it. Go on. Oh, that's a lot of powder. Whoa, okay, that's a bit too much. Blush wise, I'm just going in with a lip and cheek tint, which because we don't really know if they wore blush or we don't really have a lot of evidence for this, that's just gonna help to create a very natural flushed look to my cheeks, just to make me look a little bit more alive, you know? That's kind of important. You can see it's extremely, extremely subtle. Now, before I do my eyes, I'm just gonna do my brows. And this is because I feel like if I don't have anything on my brows, my face is gonna look very kind of disproportionate if then my eyes have really heavy makeup. So I'm just gonna go in and, you know, brush them and just add a little color to them. All right, so something like this. And as you can see, I'm still keeping it super natural. My eyes, yay, the part that always makes me super nervous. So to be fair, I'm feeling way more confident about this this time than I was during the ancient Greek video because it had been, I think, years since I had done black eyeliner at that point. And since the ancient Greek video, I did do black eyeliner on a few more occasions just to play around with it. So I'm feeling like I have a bit more practice with this kind of look now. I think I'm just going to start adding liner and blending it and see what happens. I'm going to get really close to my mirror for this. Kidoki. Do I add a wing? Do I not add a wing? I don't know. Do I add it underneath? You can just see how much more confident I am doing this than I was in the last makeover. Why do I keep choosing looks that involve black eyeliner? I don't know, maybe I'm missing my emo days when I was 13. This is looking really bad, but that's okay because everything makes sense once blending is involved. I think I can even go a little bit more. What do you all think? It's not like you all can answer me through the camera, but I'll just guess that you all said, yes, add more. I think that's definitely more than I added for the ancient Greek video, which is a good thing. All right, let's start blending. I don't even know if there's meant to be a wing, but that's okay, we're gonna add a wing. Okay, this is looking kind of cool, I think. It's like unblended, blended. You can see how much it makes a difference. It's just massive. And then now I think I need to add some to the bottom and sort of straighten everything out to make it look a bit more clean. And well, not that it needs to look clean and perfect, but you know, just a little bit more even. <laughs> okay. For any of you who don't already know, I'm not a makeup artist. I think it's uh, pretty obvious to be able to tell that. I think I'm actually really happy with this and how it turned out. I think it looks good overall. I might just add a little things to it here and there. I think it's safe to move on to the hair, the final part. Oh, and then jewelry as well, but that's pretty straightforward. So basically the final part. 
obviously hair is even even less uh, livable than clothing that disintegrates immediately. There are a few options that we can look at. There are these like quite famous little Valkyrie like kind of little icons, I would call them. Uh, but they've been found over, all over Scandinavia. So the thing is that we're not quite sure if what they're wearing on their head is braided hair or if it is like a wrap. These figurines are very stylized and we just don't know. There's a bog body that was found that has like a really elaborate like fancy braid in the hair that looks a lot like these little figurines that have like the little knots in their hair. I think she's called Elling Woman, I think. This, this hair. And there's also like the option to use a head wrap. I think especially for working women, that would have been, you know, you don't want to get grime and stuff in your hair when you're working. And they were very particular about their like uh, hygiene and braiding hair and brushing hair. And they were like known for bathing once a week, which says a lot about how little <laughs> bathing was normalized in that era. But but braided hair is definitely a good option for that. There is a dove outside of my window making a lot of noise. So hopefully it's not super annoying in this recording. But now that my makeup look is done, more or less, I'm going to do my hair. So I let my hair kind of just more or less keep a sort of natural texture to it. Uh, it's actually a lot more wavy than this typically. Uh, but I didn't add any product or anything to it just to keep it as natural and smooth as possible. That way I could do this hairstyle that Lilia very kindly sent me a tutorial of, which is basically a braid created with the top of your hair, and then you utilize that braid in the middle to then make another braid behind it. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm not great at hair, but I can definitely do braids. <laughs> I'm really, really grateful to Lilia for sending me so much useful info and other stuff because uh, it was really such a massive, massive help. I'm gonna start just by kind of like grabbing pieces of my hair. And as you can see, my hair gets just really, really knotted. So I have to do something about that. And I'm gonna just grab all the pieces that are sort of gonna be in my face and in the way along my hairline. And I get really, really dry scalp this time of year with the weather changes. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't show through on the camera, but if it does, we're all humans, right? I'm sure many of you are going through the same. Having to do this in the mirror is actually really challenging. Let's see. I actually have to do it off of the mirror because I'm better at braiding through muscle memory. Oh, my arms hurt so bad right now. <laughs> uh, it's not looking great at the front there, but I think it's gonna be good enough if I just kind of pull things a bit. All right, so now that I've got this braid here, I'm gonna take the rest of my hair, part it into two pieces, and then use this braid in the middle as the middle piece of the braid since the braid is built up of three pieces. And then it's done. So it's a very straightforward hairstyle and I'm glad because I really don't know how much mental power I'll have to uh, do anything more complicated at the moment. I really genuinely have no idea what it looks like in the back, but that's okay. As long as it looks okay in the front. For me, that's all that matters for this. And yeah, I think this is the final hair and makeup look. From what I can tell, it turned out really nice. I am looking at it from a pretty small little mirror here and I can't really see most of the sides. The final thing is a necklace. So I sent Lilia some pictures of different necklaces I have in my jewelry collection and she gave a pretty strong yes to one that she thought would work the best, which is a vintage coral necklace that I own. It looks really cute. I think this was the perfect choice. So huge thanks to Lilia again for her expertise. And I think it looks really nice with the red tones as well with the wool. Now I'm excited to show you all the final look. I can't believe it finally all came together.
Well, there you have it. This has been my Viking makeover. I hope you've enjoyed watching it. Let me know in the comments below what other makeovers you might want to see in the future because I would like to continue the series and I think it has a lot of possibilities. A huge thanks again to Lilia Husmo for providing her wonderful wisdom and knowledge about Viking fashion for this video. And another thank you to the sponsor of this video, Brooklinen. Brooklinen is offering you all a special discount of $20 off any order over $100 just click the link in the description box down below and use my code VXBirchwood at checkout. If you'd like to see me and one of my very close friends eat only medieval food for a week, then be sure to click on this video next. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in two weeks for another video. Also, thank you so much for 100,000 subscribers. I was just genuinely blown away to learn about that. So yes, thank you so, so much. I'm so incredibly grateful from the bottom of my heart.